what is really happening in all of us strangers. We are going to talk about it. We are going to figure it out. There's a bunch of different ways to interpret it, but we've been dying to have this conversation ever since we reviewed it. We did a non-spoiler review a few weeks back. We can both agree that we love this movie. It's gorgeous, um, but there's a lot open for interpretation there as far as what is really, really happening. So, spoilers yes. now. Stop, they, stop. If they you begin don't now. Know. People just sometimes want to know. Sure. I'm assuming you're not with anyone. I never see you with anyone. <laughs> so, Andrew Scott's character, Adam, is a, uh, a screenwriter, and he... Uh, goes to visit his his childhood home and discovers that the ghosts of his parents are still living there uh and they're exactly as they were in 1987 when they died in a car accident when adam was 12 years old meanwhile he also lives in this mostly abandoned seeming high rise uh that seems to have one other tenant um which is harry this uh a gay guy played by paul mescal who drunkenly knocks on Adam's door one night and, uh, you know, is very, very like teetering on blackout drunk. And Adam is like, you know what? Sleep it off. We'll talk later and, you know, whatever. And then eventually the two of them get together and this romance blossoms and they go out and they, you know, uh, have this really intense sexual chemistry. And, uh, you know, it's just this really great kind of romance unfolding. But then when Adam wants to take Harry with him, to the child at home to see the parents harry sort of begs off and is reticent and it is at that moment that we ultimately realize that harry too is a ghost and when adam goes to his apartment he sees harry's corpse still curled up with the vodka the whiskey bottle that he was holding the night that he knocked on adam's door okay so i did not realize that in that moment that you did okay uh, <laughs> i did not realize it until you know, Adam goes to Harry's apartment and it's like the TV is still on and it's just trashed. And then he opens the bedroom and like the stench is so overwhelming that he is like taken aback by it. And they all you see, you don't see his body. You just see like the shoulder or like the elbow of the sweatshirt that he was wearing. Mm. And maybe if you were astute enough to remember the color of the sweatshirt that he was wearing, <laughs> you'd realize that that's what he's wearing the night he first knocked on Adam's door. So I totally didn't get all that, right? Like on first viewing, on the only viewing, I was like, okay, wait, they kind of have a bit of a falling out after they go to the parent's house. Has he been like drinking and, you know, getting high and he accidentally OD'd, but he'd been talking a bit about suicide prior to that. Because one of the first things that he says when he's standing in Adam's doorway is that they've like locked all the windows so you can't jump out. Right. Like the idea of jumping out of a window has occurred to him. Right. Yeah. And so he's a little unstable. So I thought that he died, that the romance was real, that he was a real guy uh -huh. <laughs> and that he died after that. But thinking about it afterward you're right and the sweatshirt gives it away he's wearing the same thing he wore the first night so this whole thing has been a fantasy which makes it all that much more heartbreaking yeah. because when you realize like this whole love affair that he had that was so nourishing at a time of a great loneliness and isolation was all fake was all imaginary in his mind like my heart just broke for him all over again because like clearly he's missing his parents they're not real he knows they're not real but you know this is the fantasy he's cooked up in his head also is this whole thing just a screenplay because the words like interior or no sorry, exterior house 1987 appear on the typewriter or whatever and then he goes to the house right. so are we watching the evolution of his screenplay I think possibly, yeah. In any event, I think that the the imagine his imagination, his his like uh, evocation of these real people who he knows or knew his parents, yeah. and this creation of this guy who he met briefly once and has like created this whole like sort of fantasy story with, is all meant to be, you know. That this guy is a screenwriter. This is what he does. Mm -hmm. You know, he creates characters, he creates situations, he creates dialogue. And what we have seen him do this entire movie, thinking that, yeah, so obviously the parents are ghosts and, you know, mm -hmm. but not realizing that, oh, no, no, this other guy who's been around the entire movie also not really there. Like, even when there's even scenes where they go out to, like, 
clubs and stuff, but no one talks to both of them. Like, you know, you, when you, when you piece it together later, you realize, oh, he just was out by himself that whole time, but he thought that this guy was with him. Yeah, um, I didn't realize that in the moment at all. I didn't. Yeah. In retrospect, it makes sense that no one else talks to them. Yeah, no. But I didn't in the pick moment, I'm it. like, oh. Yeah, I don't pick up on. It. I didn't pick up on it until the reveal at the end. But then it's like, ah, okay. Um, and you know, this is an adaptation of uh, a Japanese. Uh, I'm not. It was a, a novel originally. I think it's been adapted into more sort of straightforward horror films about someone. You know confronting ghosts of their past who turn out to be uh, malevolent. But uh, Haig basically just kind of keeps the ghost of the past part, mm -hmm. you know, and, and uses that as a way to sort of explore this guy's deep longing for human connection, both in, both for the parents that he lost at a very young age to this guy that he we ultimately realize he's created a relationship with out of whole cloth. Yeah, and you realize in, in retrospect how much Andrew Haig relies on reflections both in windows and in like the mirrors of the elevator yeah. to sort of like make us wonder what's real and what's not. And I thought in the watching of it that I was just meant to be like sort of a, an illusory kind of mood setting device, right? Mm. Not that he was like, indicating, hey, <laughs> this person's not real. Because one of the first things you see is him getting, Adam getting up and seeing his own reflection in the window with like the darkness of London and the distance and all that. So I think from the very beginning, it's sort of an, an eerie kind of isolated, chilly mood. And only afterwards you realize that that's very intentional from a narrative perspective as well. I have to say, like, the, I think one of the reasons that I don't love this movie the way that a lot of folks do is because to me, the the thread of the parents and the thread of the boyfriend, while they both offer a lot of really powerful moments along the way, they didn't quite cohere together at the end for me as this sort of big thing of like, ah, you know, he's making all of this up. And it's more in talking about it that that I see what the threads are and how they come together and what they all mean and what they, how they're all sort of saying the same thing about this guy and his hunger for, for, you know, connectivity. But in the moment of watching it, it kind of felt like it was sort of two separate streams, you know? And mm -hmm. so I, I do plan to watch it again and see if maybe it lands a little better for me, but along the way there are individual moments with, you know, Jamie Bell and Claire Foy playing the parents with Paul Mescal that are, that you just really hit me in the gut and that are, are beautifully done and, and are very indicative of the kind of filmmaker that Andrew Haig is, who I find to be so kind of emotionally fluent in terms of telling these stories and really digging into these characters, whether it's something, you know, that's relationship based like weekend or 45 years or a story like lean on Pete about a kid who's just sort of looking for, you know, a sense of fa family and, and belonging. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it, I do recommend the movie. I think people sure. should see it. It's really gorgeous. Yeah. This is an understated quality to his storytelling and yet there's such like really powerful emotional truths that emerge from that. Yeah. The, all the stuff with seeing his parents and like going back to his childhood bedroom and being able to, to come out to his mom. Yeah. Yeah. This is a big deal and um, take that picture like they, they decorate for Christmas, you know, and the, and the jammies and it sounds uh, like he's regressing emotionally, but this is like stuff that he needs to work through stuff that he is it's wish fulfillment. Right. Yes. And so you realize that the arrival of Harry on his doorstep is the catalyst that inspires him to go back to his youth and reconnect with the idea of his parents. So. I don't think that they're slammed together. I think that one influences the other as far as the flow of his his storytelling and his sure. emotional catharsis. You know? and, and, they're, and they're both cases of wish fulfillment, really. Yeah. So sad. He's been yeah. by himself in this building the whole time. Like, nobody else lives in this building. <laughs> Is the building well, even real? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you, though, you know, you do see, like, in big cities, like, these all these buildings going up, and, like, they don't seem to be fully occupied in fact there's a really good documentary called push not based on the novel uh, by sapphire <laughs> um about how like in all these cities you know lower income people are being displaced so that people can put up these giant buildings and then hardly anybody moves into them because the apartments just become these sort of little financial chits that get traded over and over and over again as part of like you know uh, uh 
you know, they're business, corporate investments, business things. Yes, yeah. as an investment, basically. Yeah. Anyway, so this is gorgeous, and um, I really loved it. And and like you, I do want to go back and rewatch it to to gather all those wonderful little details along the way. Let us know if you guys saw it. Were you confused? Did you have a giant light bulb going over your head? Did you cry? I mean, we just. Uh, did you interpret it differently? Because right, I've, I've, I've definitely, I think there are people who come away from it thinking different things. And I'm not saying my read is necessarily the correct one, but I mean, I, I would be curious to see how people read the film. So yeah, let us know in the comments.